Welcome to the Pat Sheranian Show, and thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate to your time. We are happy that you're here with us, and uh, hope that you're having a great day, and hope that you've recovered from yesterday. Now, I know that most of the world is out on a Black Friday, spending all their money and bumping into crowds, but if you happen to be in a car and listening to us on KHQN 1480 AM, we appreciate you. And if you're listening to pat.utahvalleylive.com, then we know you're on streaming video with us, and we appreciate that. So thank you wherever you are, and I hope you're safe. It's getting colder in Utah, but the sun was out this morning. There's always hope that the day will warm up no matter what. My guest this morning is a good friend, Helene Holt. Hi. Hello, Pat. It's so <laughs> it's good, good to, to be here. Ha- it's good to have you here. Uh, actually, we live around the corner from each other, plus two blocks. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I've seen you in almost a year. It's been a <laughs> long, it's been a That's long time. That's the way life goes. <laughs> She's been a busy lady, and we're going to tell you about um, uh, the BYU Motion Picture Studio where we met and uh, her books that she has been working on and some books she's still working on, some movies that may be in the making. And we're going to get glamorous here, more so than Hollywood, in our chit-chat with you. So uh, thank you for joining us. And I do need to mention Kayani, of course. They are my... Uh, main sponsor for this hour every day and it has the products have changed my life completely I was diabetic high blood pressure high cholesterol crippling arthritis uh, blood sugars totally out of control for 14 years with medication somewhat controlled then I found the Kayani products and they changed my life K-Y-A-N-I for 14 years I was taking medications for all these things and now I have been for 15 months medication free, just using the products in Kayani. So look them up online, kyani.net. And my phone number is 801 362 9552. 801 362 9552. Now I want to tell you about it and share a little bit with you. There's a business opportunity, or you can be a customer and just feel good all the time. I certainly didn't have this kind of energy 20 years ago, and now I do. The only thing that changed in that period of time has been the last 15 months when I started taking these products. So with that, Helene, yes. let's talk about you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, let's start back because you've had kind of an interesting trip along the way. You were raised uh, not right here in Provo Town. No, not at all. <laughs> let's pull the mic a little bit closer to you. There you go. Okay. And uh, let's start with, where were you born? Berkeley, California. And um, I lived there throughout, you know, all my growing up years and this, throughout the San Francisco Bay Area, Walnut Creek, Lafayette, that area too. Moved to Utah in 1980. And I didn't realize that. Did you just come here four years before I did? Yes. So you had just started yes. a few years earlier at right. BYU? Oh, I didn't even, I, had, I joined BYU in 1984. So you just were there before I got there? Yes. I had no idea. I thought you'd been there for yes. years and years. No. And years. Mm-hmm. All these years and I never knew right. that. Oh, right. Oh, for goodness <laughs> sakes. Well, Helene was the reason I came up to, to BYU. Uh-huh. I met her, had so much fun at the motion picture studio out by the river. Um, visiting with her and I thought boy this girl's got more energy in life she can make anything happen and she did and uh, then when I they gave me a nod uh, I didn't come because of the director of the motion picture studio or what I thought it would achieve or anything else I came because Helene was so much fun I thought we can do lots of stuff together and we have but I want to talk more about your career at the motion picture studio because there were a lot of things that you saw happen there you Mm -hmm. were filming um, the uh, LDS Firesides, Church Firesides mm-hmm. at that time with General Authorities. We did. And um, I, were, you, may, were you in on any of the films that they made, at that, the Hugh Nibley film? Were you involved in maybe the editing part of that? Yes. Well, what I was doing is I, everything that Hugh Nibley said when he went over to Egypt and so on, I had to enter, I had to make copies of everything that he said and I'll tell you that's uh, not an easy thing that was not an easy thing a lot of it was phonetic spelling for me because there were names and things that I had never ever even heard of and he was coming up with them of course when he was going through the catacombs in Egypt and naming this that and the other (laughs) things that I had no clue about so anyway I got to do the transcript oh I didn't realize that well fun Mm -hmm. interesting that was do you remember the name of that little uh, uh, that uh, video that we made it that they made at that time about Hugh Nibley? Uh-huh, Faith um, of the... 
Oh, of an observer. Faith of the observer. Of an observer. Something like faith, yeah, of, faith an observer. of an observer. It's, uh, you can still get that, I think, at BYU through their media department, but if you haven't got it and you love Hugh Nibley, that's a film that you want to have. It's a classic. It is. I think, and I'm not sure, I think this is in the finished product, but maybe not. I don't remember. Um, I really appreciated He had a near-death experience. He did? He did. And... Um, when he talked about it, it really impressed me because he said, I forget what it was that caused caused it. Um, but anyway, he went to the other side and he said, I mean, he talked about the colors, of course, everything's so vivid. But every question that he had, he suddenly got answered. And it happened he didn't so have fast. To ask it. Yeah. And he, it happened so fast for him that he knew that on the other side, he would just have gain instant knowledge of things. And it, answer, it answered a big question for him for this life, and of course then he came back to this life. But that near death was very impressive to him, and of course, to anyone who Well, I remember him the first, it. and I've talked about this on the air, <clears throat> one of the first books I bought um, after watching him and a presentation, listening to him, was Joseph Smith's Book of Breathings, uh, Joseph Smith Papyrus. Mm -hmm. And you cannot read Nibley. You ponder him. You may read one line and then you ponder. What, is, what did he mean by that? And he's one of the few people that I have ever met and ever expect to that had memorized the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price. Right. And he had memorized the entire books. And not only that, understood them. So he was quite an amazing man to sit down and visit with at any time. Very amazing. I think, for me, his books are more readable than listening to it. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. Because uh -huh. you can reread right. it. Right. Go back and, <laughs> and I collect love, the thoughts. Yeah, his he, books are just, just an great. amazing mind. We, uh, yeah. we have Joy <clears throat> Bischoff, who has um, become quite a student of his over the years, and she's on, at, uh, on radio in the afternoon from 5 to 6. In fact, I think today might be her last weekly show, and then she'll be on every Friday from 5 to 6 on mm -hmm. 1480 AM, and you can catch her there. Um, all right, so then, while you were at the Motion Picture Studio, mm -hmm. on your lunch hour, it was really hard to get to you because you closed your office door and you were working on something that you'd been working on for a few years. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that book because when I met you, I was knocked out that you could do all the things you were doing, mm -hmm. and Peter Johnson was the director at the time, and still have time to write a manuscript. So. Right. Do you have that book in this pile somewhere? I do. That's this one. <laughs> okay. This is the first Can edition of it. Can we hold that it? up? If you hold it straight out, the camera will try and find you. Um, yep, just hold it right straight up there. Good. Exiled. Right. And you talk about what it's about a little bit because you okay. tackled a heavy subject. Right. Well, when we lived in California, before we moved back to Utah in 1980, um, this is kind of a spiritual journey for me, but I was impressed that I was supposed to research the life of John Lathrop. And John Lathrop, um, at that time, I knew very little about him. I had only read about two paragraphs about him in Marky e. Peterson's book, okay. The Great Prologue. And I don't know why, I just received this tremendous impression to research his life. Um, Mark Peterson looked at him as one of the great forerunners of freedom in America and, you know, to all that we have, this nation. So anyway, I lived in the country. We had a ranch. We lived, we had horses, cows, chickens, pigs, sheep, goats, this you, was you name Berkeley? it. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> this was in, uh, in the Auburn area, okay. Northern California. <laughs> I thought, we're in Berkeley. Yeah, Let me think when about this that. happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, we'd never go over in Berkeley. But anyway, we had... So I just didn't know how I could possibly have the time to do the research. We had a ranch. I was busy, little children growing up. Uh, it just seemed impossible to tackle something like that. Then lo and behold, a couple of years later, we were on our way. We moved back to Utah. And we live within walking distance of the, you know, the BYU library. There is a place to do research. And, of course, the Family Research Center and so on. I had no idea at all when I started that... John Lathrop was the forefather of four U.S. presidents, Joseph Smith, now a total of seven prophets come from him in the LDS church. Other prominent church leaders in other churches, uh, statesmen, artists, writers, you name it. Let's name some. 
Okay. <laughs> well, a recent discovery is Gordon B. Hinckley and also Sarah Palin. And, of course, everybody knows her now. And then Drew Gilpin Faust, who is the current president of Harvard. She is also a direct descendant. I seem I recall the Mellon family. Were they a, a descendant of his also? No? I, don't, I don't know. Maybe. I mean... No, I'm thinking about what's in the back of the book. I just right. recall him, but that's not right. one of the families, right? I don't think okay. I have that one back okay. there. Um, <clears throat> okay, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Bushes, both Bushes, Ulysses S. Grant, those four presidents are direct uh, descendants of this man. Um, Adlai Stevenson, Mitt Romney, John Huntsman, and John Huntsman, Jr., the list goes on. A lot of prominent people are his descendants. Is this the book that the, uh, the genealogy is in the back of? Since our well, this one, <clears throat> there's, there have been actually four different editions. Let me tell you the difference. Okay. okay. This then one, we have to know a little bit about the story. About how oh, okay. Okay. Okay, well, basically, <clears throat> the story is um, John Lathrop had been a minister in the Church of England. And then he left the church in a very prominent diocese, the Canterbury Diocese. Okay. He left the church uh, and took a stand for freedom of conscience, and he went to live in an area of London called Lambeth, uh, which, which was really a, basically a separatist headquarters. Now, Marky Peterson refers to John Lathrop as a separatist. There were Puritans and separatists in that age. They generally didn't get along in the sense that the Puritans, they just wanted to purify the Church of England. They didn't, they weren't rallying for independence away from the Church of England. Just purify the doctrines. The separatists wanted complete separation of, from the Church of England, freedom to follow their own religion, their own conscience, so on. And they kind of looked at the Puritans as, um, well, what would we say, pantyways, or, you know, <laughs> they're just, you know, they're weak, and we're the strong ones. We're taking okay. that stand. Well, under John Lothrop's leadership, they would all come together because he was not a divider. He was a uniter, and all the groups loved him, whether they were Puritan or separatist. And they came from all over England to, into these secret meetings to hear him. And then the Bishop of London, uh, well, the king called the Bishop of London and, and alerted him. Another bishop of, um, I forget what the bishop I can't remember that bishop's name. But anyway, he alerted um, Bishop William Laud that there was a separatist in his area, and uh, he better find him. And it was John Lathrop. He gave him the name. Well, then Bishop Laud sent his tracker after him to find him, and eventually they did. He was arrested. He was put in prison. After about a year, there were 60 people um, <coughs> 18 had escaped, 42 were arrested. They went to trial in the you know, Star Chamber High Commission trial. Um, they were all released after about a year, except for John Lothrop. He was considered too dangerous to set loose. So they um, kept him in prison. But he was the type, he was so powerful a leader that uh, to starve him to death in prison or do something like that, create a martyr out of him, would have been worse than to yeah, exile yes. him. So finally, the children and a friend took them to the bishop. And by that point, the bishop had been made the Archbishop of Canterbury, <coughs> Bishop Laud had. And so anyway, he decided to exile him to America. That's how the family got over here. He and they came to Barnstable, Massachusetts. Yes, yeah, Barnstable. Landed Built in them. Boston, met by <coughs> Governor John Winthrop, <coughs> greeted there, very happy to, to meet him. Everybody had heard about him. They knew about him. He, they knew his righteous stand in prison. You know, you have to, when I was doing the research, oh, my goodness, the prisons in that, they were not like our prisons. The prison he had been put in had been in, in existence for 500 years, oh. and it, the smell was just horrible. There were court cases where people who were had been in prison would be taken into court, 
just the smell of the people would cause people in the courtroom to faint. <laughs> I mean, it, was it was awful. Just, in it other was words. awful. Yeah. It was awful. And they didn't One get any bedding. Yeah. yeah, they didn't get any bedding. <laughs> if they had straw, it you know soon turned to dust. Or and some of them had were in prison cells where there was standing water. Um, some of them had cells where there were spikes coming out from the walls to deliberately make things even more uncomfortable than they were. Um, they were dark, hellish holes. Um, if they got any food, the prison served water, what they called water soup. It was bread boiled in water, and they got that once a day, unless some merciful person from the outside would bring them something. So he, he had a family. Uh, yes, had he did. A family. He did have a family. He'd had eight <laughs> children. One had died, and so he had seven living children at this time. And, of course, the pressure was on him. We can't. You can get your freedom. You can have all your blessings restored. Now, remember, the clergy and John Lathrop was a part of that. He was considered a gentleman and a scholar. He was one of the top 5% in England. All the rest were commoners. So he had this tremendous standing and influence over all of the, basically over all of the population in England. Well, the and trial yet he was chose huge. Huge. Yes, the, and well documented because, as I recall, you used court documents. Yes, and as that was part a, of your research. Yes, as part of my research, and I'll tell you, my that was what eighteen seven. Oh uh, no, sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of miracles happened to me as I was doing the research. I knew there had to be. Well, I hope there had to be some kind of court record or documentation, and I went just down to the BYU library. And I asked them, where would I find chancery records? And they said, go down to the first floor. So I went down to the first floor and um, asked someone at the desk, and they directed me over to an area. And the books there were huge. They were like this and this. They were so you huge. You couldn't lift them. <laughs> no. I thought, I'm not going to go in those books. So I went back up just to the main floor, went to the card index, and started researching there. And I pulled out a couple of numbers that I thought, well, index numbers. Maybe this, these books will have something. The very first book I went to had that trial of John Lathrop in it. Oh, my goodness. And, Pat, I have to thank you because this is your expression. Because I, the, I know the Lord must have known I have the attention span of a gnat. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that, that for years. Yeah. I have to find it in a hurry. Yeah. It has to happen in a hurry because yeah. I no attention I know, span. because <coughs> I, basic, I probably would have given up. I, I probably would have thought, oh, it's not here. I'm just going to leave. But it was the very first book that I came to. And in the preface to that book, the uh, uh, Reginald Rosson Gardner, who was the editor of this, and he had done volumes and volumes of English history, highly respected historian, and he's he said right in the preface of the book, the trial of John Lathrop in this book, you know, is an example of the trials against the nonconforming ministers who went head to head against Bishop William Laud. And so right there, there was the complete trial. And anyway, it's... Um, it's a great book, and I loved reading it. And I remember after I finished reading, I think it was still in manuscript form uh -huh. <coughs> when I read it. <clears throat> and I said, this should be a movie, because it was the kind of thing I couldn't put down. Well, if you can't put a book down or a manuscript, it, there's every chance it will make a good movie. And so <clears throat> I'm going to skip forward just a little bit, and you can fill in the other spaces. Okay, well, let me finish on this. No, you, I have to you, do this. You, you, okay, you can do that, but don't let me forget. I'm not going to let you forget where you are. In the back. No, okay. We're going to go to the <laughs> Okay. Because I, um, before I left, I was, of course, aware of this. Helene and I worked together. And then Elder Haight called me on a mission to Washington, D.C. South Mission. Oh, we just got a note from someone that said they read it also and really liked it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. And um, so Helene called me. I was still on my mission. and but It was a public affairs mission, so a little bit different mission. And, <clears throat> and she said, we're ready to go, and I want you to come home. When you get home, I was within a week of leaving. She said, I want you to call Charlton Heston oh. <laughs> and Peter O'Toole. <laughs> and I said, well, sure, why not? 
Now, this was how many years ago? Oh, Twenty some talking, years ago. Yeah, long and time ago. Uh, you didn't need to go through um, an iron gate and twenty-two security guards to find an actor at that time <laughs> and have to be licensed as an agent. And I actually wound up talking to Charlton Heston, and um, this was so many years ago. His agent then referred me to his agent, but we came within a wink of getting <laughs> Peter O'Toole to be was it the bishop? Laud. Uh-huh. Yeah, Bishop Laud. And Charlton Heston as, was it? John Lathrop. John Lathrop, yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, I remember those days because I thought we're surely going to do this. And all we needed to raise was $22 million. <laughs> well, economy was good. That would be easy. Turned out not to be so easy. But it still should be a movie, particularly at this time, because this man fought for freedom. And he truly brought it about. The exile turned out to be a blessing. Oh, so, a tremendous blessing. Right. And we'll let you take it from there. Okay. Um, Had to get a piece of Well, Hollywood right now, there. this story, the story of John Lathrop, is more timely today than ever before, simply because freedom is at stake now, Absolutely. more than it has ever been. But so is the family. <laughs> Who would ever have thought the family unit itself, tra- the traditional family, would be at stake as it is today? And yet it is. So and th- this is one and of God, th- religion, Christianity. Look what's happening throughout America. Those are the three things at stake today. That is what this book is about. It is. So it really that's is. It's why a great it's timely. Book. It's a great history. Um, it's a, a good read, as they say. Very exciting. Now, bring it up to date because the okay. cover has changed. Cover has changed. And tell us about the publishers. Then. Okay. Um, <laughs> This, for, I'll briefly tell this, uh, the difference in the publishers. This first one, it has three pages of Descendants in it. That's it. After I did this, I did, oh, a tremendous amount of research, continuing to research what prominent Descendants would come from him. The next edition, I had a complete, this has 228 pages in the book, right? The next edition, I had a different publisher, and it has 309 pages. Now, a lot of that is all attributable to the expansion of the appendices in the back of the book. But the problem here is a um, couple of things. The, um, the publisher wanted to keep the book as short as possible, limit the pages, page count, And he made me take out some of the text in the story here in the first edition in order to accommodate more of what I wanted to expand in the appendices. So I had to make a choice there. So I took out basically a whole chapter out of this book. And then um, and then the problem here in this one is the typesetter. The cover cover changed dramatically. And that yeah, this is the the cover. but to our I, radio audience, she's holding up. The <laughs> first uh, book had just a, a, a crown with a cross through it right. um, with uh, exile, the word exiled, in red on white cover. Now, the second one that she's holding up is, and that's a hardback. Uh-huh. This is a very nice paperback, and it's uh, in the orange, reds, blacks, and it had, has a picture of a man on the front of it. Right. Um, That's a, d- a depiction of John Lathrop. Okay. Right. And, um, but the problem with this edition is I went in to the typesetters to pick up the final copy for review. And he said, oh, the publisher just came by, said you don't need to review it. That That is standard. The author always reviews the final sure, copy and passes off on it. So he said, I didn't need to. So I said, I assumed, okay, somebody's going to review it. So anyway, he took it. And I mean, I didn't have it. I never got to see it until the book came out. I went to get it. And the typesetter had accidentally dropped all the footnote codes in the back. Oh, my goodness. So after every name of a descendant went, that I had some expanded information on him, there was no footnote to indicate he'd made them all end notes. But the end notes became all just one big, long, run-on paragraph or page, pages. And I said, the book can't go out like this. And the publisher said it would bankrupt him if it didn't. And I said, well, better bankrupt 
just you and not me too. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. So anyway, she's starting uh, to get tough. Yeah. So anyway, he we we <coughs> struck a compromise, and he promised he would put in an errata sheet. Okay. About that. But I don't know, you know, that's a lot of work to put in a rata sheet in every book. And I, I don't know if it ever happened or not. All right. Okay. So then there's the next one. Then there's the next edition, this one. So, and I loved this publisher. And so when the time came to do this next edition, this is the third publisher, right? Okay. Um, with this edition, I expanded quite a bit more. I had a lot more many more descendants I had more information so here I just you know wanted to up, update it again our board operator today Kelly is uh, has just written my grandparents told me about this book last year and told me John Lathrop was my ancestor oh well cool so there you go <laughs> okay. so we're talking about folks that you come from kiddo. right okay okay so anyway in this one I expanded a lot I proofed everything, gave it all back to the typesetter. It was ready to go. In fact, I had even, at the very last minute, I had two more names to add. And so I brought the typesetter a chocolate Marie Calendar pie. <laughs> Would you please squeeze in these That's two extra bribery. names? Yeah, <laughs> extra names. And he said, sure, he did. But what I didn't know was the publisher came along after me and did his own edit. Uh-oh. Those names he took out. Plus, he took out a lot of other names. And the embarrassing thing is, I sent this book to, for example, one person who was newly in this edition. He was a mayor back in Norwich, Connecticut. And I said, I, I told him, I said, your name is in and this new wasn't. edition. <laughs> and the pu publisher had taken out all the mayors. They weren't in the old edition. Just take them out. Well, these two editions are exactly the same number of pages. He didn't tell me he this needed to be the same length or anything. He allowed me to go ahead and make all of my changes, all of my editions, the message and then here took whatever I did. Be what he did what you're I, working with. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, that leads us to the fourth edition. Okay. Now, I, Kelly's asked yeah. a question. What would I, she's asked, what would I get out of reading this book knowing it's my ancestor? Okay, let me answer that right after I okay. tell about this one. This one is the fourth publisher. He, knowing my woes and my history of publishing, he said, you put in anything you want. This edition has um, not only all of the, fortunately, I had kept all of my copy, I knew it has all of the new descendants, even more, has at least 35 more new prominent descendants. Plus, it has a chapter in here that none of the other publishers would let me put in. And every professional ge genealogist from the very beginning said, you should have that information in there. But it was too long. You know, it was like 18 pages. And it was um, it had to do with my research how I concluded Thomas was the oldest and not the fifth born. Initially, I thought, this is going to be easy to do. I just have to research what, what all the genealogists have found. Ah, one genealogist says Thomas is the eldest. Another says he's the fifth child. One says John, young John died in infancy. The other said, no, he grew to manhood and lived in England. I mean, all these discrepancies. Let me, let Newgate me, prison or, or the clink, let, all of these. Let me read this. It is so easy to forget the, the uh, trivial, uh, travail of those who made it us the first free people in modern times. Exiled will help many thousands to appreciate more deeply the magnificent victory won for religious rights which we must preserve. Cleon Skousen. Cleon Skousen. That Founder was in a letter he National wrote National Center for Constitutional <clears throat> Studies, and we've been talking about him last week, and we'll be talking some more. That's a pretty darn good in endorsement on this book. Yes, it is. And uh, you, everyone should have this. Is this out where they can buy it? Is, or, is well, it the you can get it through can... Deseret Book. Okay. Or there's a, our, uh, yeah, and that would be the best. Like, or if it's not there, you just ask the bookstore to order it for you. And they can order it on demand. <laughs> and they can order it. Okay. Yeah. This is great. Now, you might talk about the rewards because that's where it was headed when we started this book. I wanted, as, a, as an oh. author, uh, everybody wants to write the best book. Some wind up doing that. 
But I happen to be at a dinner where you won the John uh, the George Washington Honor Award, and so would you like to tell about oh, that a little bit and the, sure. the full name of that award? Because it's quite amazing in this day and age that those things are even awarded, particularly the side of the Mississippi. Seems right. to me if you write east of that, <laughs> they think you were more involved in what was going on. Right. Um, <clears throat> the day I finished the first rough draft when we lived here in Utah, um, I then there was a deadline for the Utah uh, Utah Arts Council original writing contest, and I mailed it in that day, <laughs> and then called BYU. Do you have any jobs o job openings? <laughs> and that's when I got the BYU motion picture job. Okay, mailed it in, forgot about it, and I got first prize in that original writing contest. Congratulations! Um, that was a big step. For yeah, you. and then the next the big award honor was this George Washington Medal of Honor, which is it comes from the Freedoms Foundation at Valley Forge. So that was a very, very exciting. And they had that a big dinner up in Salt Lake that and honored. everybody that was anybody was <laughs> and, there. And President Monson was there. He, he, I mean, he was, well, president of the Quorum of Twelve, right, I guess, at the at time. At that time. Yeah. And then I also entered it in the screenplay division of the Thunderbird International Film Festival. And at the end, it won a best story. And then the head of the Fed Festival said, we've got two best stories. How am I going to separate this? And because this was a, based on a true story, they made it best true story. Um, the judge of that, all those award, uh, all the screenplays in that festival, said it was her favorite her personal favorite of that. all of them. She said, but on page 10 in the screenplay, she said, you introduce a lot of a lot more people. And I felt like that needed to be corrected a little bit because if this ended up, he said, as it would be on 5,000 desks, if we gave you the grand prize, it will be on 5,000 desks <laughs> in Southern California. When they would get to page 10, they would stop reading. And it's the type of story they have to read all the way to the end. She said, but anyway, so what I What did you have on page 10? Um, John Lathrop was in a meeting with his, all of his friends. Oh, all okay. of his friends. So anyway, I modified it a little bit to make it clear, more clear as to what everything was going on. And that screenplay has changed, too, quite a bit. But anyway, so those are the You're honors and awards. You're still working on raising the money. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I got a call just a couple of weeks ago um, from a producer director who's always wanted to do this. Who asked if they ah, could? I know who that is. Who? Well, I'm not going to say. Oh, okay, he don't say. He not. doesn't live here. He's in Idaho. Oh no! But he's always wanted to do I, it. Well, too. he's the one I know. He's in Montana. Oh, okay. He's in You're Montana. Right. Well, yeah. you, you no, hear us talking to. away here, but um, these are well-known movie directors right, and producers right, right. and don't want to use their name um, inappropriately but yes do let us know right when, uh, i will keep you apprised on that because this thing there happens. are good things this happening is a great on great story now she's asked this question um uh, what would she personally get out of getting this book if she reads this book about her oh okay her ancestor okay um <clears throat> Let me point to something in here. The very first couple of pages, you see a lot of comments from students in here. Right, why, don't read, why don't you read one of them? They are 13-year-old. You know, they at the, Amer the American American Heritage Academy. Um, they, I can tell you this. They love this book. Youth do. If you want to educate them about their heritage, and family, and God, and Christianity, this is the book to give them to read. At the American Heritage Academy, they read this every year. In fact, they, they're just starting to read it again now. I just got, got word. But um, in fact, I have to tell you, one young student, she came up to me. I saw her at Education Week at BYU, just ran into her. This was a couple of years ago. And she came up to me and she said, Mrs. Holt, I have to tell you, I've now read your book four times. Oh, <laughs> and, what a compliment. Yeah, it was, it was so <laughs> gratifying. But um, these students are so open. Now, the first ones that read this original hardback edition, these students, the next year, they had a combined assembly, seventh and eighth graders. And so the eighth graders... 
uh, were with the, se the seventh graders were currently reading the book. The eighth graders had already read it. And I mentioned that with this new edition, I had taken out part of the text, a chapter that was in the first original hardback, which has been restored in this, this one, one. Yeah. the last one, okay? <laughs> so anyway, um, the, the eighth graders, what part did you take out? What part? <laughs> when I told them, and it had to do with the kids, it was the least disruptive part to remove from the story since I had to take out some text. And they all went, you couldn't have taken that out. No, no, you can't take that out. Because it was focused <coughs> on so the kids. So now is it back in this? It's back yeah, okay. in. The current, this, the publisher of this edition was so fantastic. He said, you do whatever you want. We'll make it happen. Well, now this is exactly 100 pages longer than the original hardback, okay? But he also made them the footnotes, footnotes, not just end notes, so that the... Um, you can read on the same page if it has a footnote about that particular person. You can read right on that page what it says about that person. Rather than having to Rather than up. having okay. to turn back to the end notes and find it. So I think that's a plus. But he took, and it's hardly even noticeable, he reduced the font of the appendices by one. And that saved him a lot of pages, something that the others... They didn't do. You're telling me I'd have to read it with a magnifying glass? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you don't. It it's really, it's really works. And, the, and then the footnotes themselves, he reduced one again. And, but it's still readable. It is very very readable, okay, and read one of the com couple of things the kids wrote. I, I just oh yeah, were, I'm going to read what they were. That's right. I that's they right. Were really fun okay. coming from kids particularly. I know. Okay, John Lothrop was a strong example of standing firm in the powerful current of life and adversity. He was a father of this country, maybe not a founding father, but a father. Without John Lothrop's example of strength, love, and conscience, I would not have grown into what I am as I write. This country would not have as great a heritage without him. Someday I will thank him for his life and all he did for me and for America. And this is, you know, a 12-year-old wow. writing this. Um, at the first of this year, we were assigned to read the book Exiled. I thought, oh, this is just another literature assignment. But it, as I started reading it, I really got into it. And that's what happens with, the, with these youth. And it's so it's gratifying. Now, I'm looking forward. We've been 25 years waiting for this to become a movie. So it's, it's going time. to. So it's time. I hope it happens before we're dead. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it is time. It's more timely than it ever. Is, it is more timely than ever. It's a great, great story. Uh, for you personally, Kelly, to get out of this would be uh, read the book and uh, realize <laughs> this is in your DNA. And uh, I think it would be a very rewarding experience. I know that uh, Helene had given me about 10 copies, and uh, my neighborhood heard about it, and suddenly people came to me that I hadn't <laughs> really known that well and asked to buy the book. And I they were gone within a matter of just a short period of time. If you've just joined us, you're probably on KHQ in 1480 on the AM dial, or you're at pat.utahvalleylive streaming video on your internet. I am my guest today, my wonderful friend Helene Holt, uh, she is a great wife and a mother and a grandmother, and uh, in the middle of all of this, she continues to make time, because nobody finds it, but she's made time to continue her writing, uh, which is just gets better and better and better if that's possible, and so I'm excited because she's got another book here that uh, I read in its infancy when she had just put the manuscript together, and I said, that has to be a movie because it was such a timely piece, and it's called Namesake. So can we talk about that? Sure. Okay. Sure. Tell the story about that, <clears throat> because it was, it's a controversial uh, subject, uh, was then and more so now. Um, we keep saying there's not a better time than now, but this book finally has made it into a book form, is, and this is at Desert mm -hmm. Book also. Or you'd have you to ask for it. Okay, yeah. you have to ask for yeah, it. But how about it's on not Amazon? On the can you get it on Amazon? Do you I think? think you. Okay. I think you can get it on Amazon. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Well, if, if any copies have been sold, probably there's something right. there. So. Right. Um, but tell a little bit about it because I love this. It was. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's an awakening, 
for a family in several different ways. Right. And I had just come home from Israel, I think, when oh, you were writing right. this. I had just gotten right. back home from Israel. Right. And so the scenes that she describes and the things going on were very real to me. Right. Okay, I actually started writing Namesake before I did Oh, Exiled. I do remember that, but it, I yeah. hadn't read it until mm -hmm. after this one. Right. And um, I was impressed after I did the first rough draft of this to put it on the shelf and start this one. And so I did. And then after this was done, then I got back into this and and uh, and Pat, you were instrumental and in the endorsements on the back. <laughs> I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pat got Truman Madsen to read it and then Truman wrote a very gracious endorsement here in the back. And then um Let me read what it was because I don't remember it. Okay. Um, this is Truman Madsen's endorsement. Okay. Blessed are they who find words that bring to life Jesus' circle of influence. This book recreates the sensitivity of an eyewitness, and its narratives probe all the way into the heart. So that's from Truman Madsen. And then I have Dan Ludlow. That's a good one. Yeah. And Dan um, was a personal friend of mine when I, I taught English at BYU Hawaii for a while and we shared an office for a year and he was over there on sabbatical leave in fact he was there at the time when Harold B. Lee became the prophet of the church and um, President Lee called him and asked him to head the correlation program and that happened well and so then he had to leave and go back to the states but that happened the year that we were there together oh, that was teaching <clears throat> yeah and so anyway he left uh his calling as a, he was the chairman of the religion department at BYU, or dean of the College of Religion, I think it was. And he went up, you know, to you um, that? hit the correlation. So Dan, let me just say personally, Dan read several of these manuscripts from the very beginning. Okay. He said, I am very much impressed with the author's knowledge and understanding of the intricacies of Jewish laws, customs, and traditions, which have been so skillfully threaded throughout the story, along with her insights into the scriptural accounts and their interpretations. I sincerely believe this book will appeal to many different groups of readers, including Jews, Christians, historians, theologians, and those who love a good novel. Oh, wow. Very good. So that was so... Great endorsement. Yeah it, yeah, it was a great endorsement. And in fact, I gave the book to about five, the manuscript, to about five different people whose opinions I just really revered um, in the beginning. And one of them was Dan's. And um, there was a particular part. Oh, good. There okay. was a particular Wait, part. Wait, let's, let's read this out loud. Okay. Um, we just have on our screen new and used copies of uh, 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 Exiled. No, of the namesake. Of namesake. New and used copies of uh, Namesake are available on Amazon. Good. Okay, good. good. All okay, right. right. <coughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> um, so what was I saying here? Oh, several had, had read the book. And there was a particular part I wanted to know how they felt about this particular part in it. And when Dan Ludlow said, oh, don't take that out, that, I love that part, <laughs> that kind of cinched it for me. You know, it was a little miracle that happens, and I wondered, is that going to be okay? Okay. And then Stephen R. Covey gave a very nice endorsement. Read Stevens because he's, uh, he's a writer. He understands what you go right. through. An incredibly moving conversion story filled with truth and promise and especially faith. This book makes me proud to be a Christian. Um, and then there's one here from a Baptist minister in Texas. I met him years ago, and um, so I sent him a copy of, of the manuscript. He absolutely loved it. In fact, the finished product, this book, I don't know how many dozens I've given to him or sold to him, you know, because to give to his congregation. He gives to them to people. He goes over to uh, Lithuania and the Baltic states every, almost every year. Or he had been on personal missions in orphanages, and to everybody who accompanies him, he gives them this book to read on their way over there. And he he 
the quote I have from him is, a masterfully told story, great attention to detail and accuracy is the hallmark of this book. Thoroughly enjoyable. And he's been after me to get this book in Christian bookstores throughout the nation, but that's a big challenge for someone from Utah. <laughs> it is true. It's true. So. But let's talk about it. But just if okay. you'll brief me, I, I only want to take a few minutes because I want to bring up to date, get up to date okay. on uh, right. Phantom Justice. So, <coughs> but I do. Um, I don't know if you can see this for our radio audience. It's Namesake Seeking the Living Christ by Helene Holt. H O L T. Namesake. Seeking the Living Christ, a beautiful picture of Christ on the cover. Bob Barrett did that. <laughs> yes, this is one of Robert Barrett's uh, famous paintings of Christ ascending, I think. Or no, it's the is, creation. Is, but is we the took, creation, that's right. We took him and, and put him in a Jerusalem setting. And he is. He's overlooking <clears throat> Jerusalem. So this is a beautiful book and wonderfully, wonderfully written. I loved it because every page I turned, I thought, ah, surprise <laughs> at what was happening. <laughs> Um, do you want to tell just a little bit about the three sons and the father? Just sure. Because that is the, yeah. the whole part of the story and what happens right. to their family. And I have had people who have read Exiled and then have read Namesake and said, Oh, Helene, as much as I love Exiled, I love this one about I, and Christ. I understand that. Yeah. Okay, this is the story of a father who is a very prominent man in Jerusalem. He's, he's part of the great Sanhedrin. And he has three sons, and the oldest son is following in his footsteps to become a scribe. Well, he is a scribe, and to become a Pharisee. The middle son becomes a zealot, and the youngest son becomes enamored with Yeshua, or this man called Jesus, that they, some are claiming to be the Christ. So the conflict is, be, is all over who is this blasphemer, who Jesus, who some are saying is the Christ. And um, the father dies, and he charges his oldest son with selling, saving his younger son from following in, uh, in the path of a blasphemer. And they have a family history that makes it so they just do never want to be found on the wrong side of things. They do not want to follow a blasphemer. It's extremely important to this family to maintain what they have finally earned back in their um, history, their name and their reputation. And now it's strong and their father is strong. So it's, they feel that it's at risk because of this younger brother who is wanting to follow in the footsteps or follow this blasphemer. And when the father dies, it becomes a conflict between the older and the younger son. And that's what the story is all and about. And that's what the story is about. And it is really interesting. It moves very rapidly. Now, I have been involved in these books to some degree. But the one that I want her to tell you about, I really have been involved in it. Uh, she has done an enormous amount. Uh, Helene Holt has done an enormous <coughs> amount of research. Um, is still trying to raise money for this book, un unless you're going to tell me something surprising, wonderful here that you've <laughs> raised it. Uh, but I love this story. I love the name Phantom Justice. They're thinking of changing it, but it's easy to say and easy to remember. And it's the story of a young man that could be anywhere in the world today. And I'm going to let you go from there because there's history on how you wrote this because it's there based is. on a true story. Yes, there is history. Um, first of all, let me say that I, when I started doing research and writing, I had felt impressed, this was years ago, <laughs> that I was to write three stories all about freedom. One is freedom, of, um, freedom through the atonement, freedom through, through Christ and the atonement. The other is freedom, what is basic freedom? In fact, I even got an email just this morning saying that they use, uh, this friend was saying, they teach, and they use this book to teach the basic principles exiled. of freedom. Exiled. Exiled. Uh -huh. exiled, to teach the basic <coughs> principles of freedom. So exiled is freedom as freedom. Namesake is freedom through the atonement and through Christ. This third one I knew was to be directed toward youth, and it's um, freedom from, basically freedom from deception. In other words, 
following your own conscience where it takes you. And I remember Steve Covey years ago talking about, um, he was down in Arizona, I think, and he asked a huge audience, I think it had to do with abortion, but he asked them if they didn't listen to, if they just cut out all the voices from their mind and just what they felt inside, what is it? would they feel about this particular topic? I think it was abortion. Maybe it was something else. But it was something as powerful and important as that subject. And they all then universally felt the same thing if they just listened to what was in. So this book is to be directed toward youth and to get youth to uh, inwardly to listen to their conscience and not the voices that are out there. And this is Phantom Justice. This is Phantom Justice, right. So, so does, tell this where has, the story started because it started with people you knew. I think are okay. What? Well, yeah. Okay. okay. This is the basic. St- the true part of the story is this is something that happened to my uncle when he was eighty years old. His house burned down. His wife died in the fire, and he was left, you know, in another state. And he had no near nearby kin, so he ended up being swindled out of his insurance monies because they, they rebuilt his home but the secretary of the agent could see he was vulnerable he had no children nearby no family close by she just forged every check she submitted receipts of things that she had bought you know $5,000 worth of clothes while my uncle was having to cash in stock just to pay to live until he got his insurance money now he was Oh, he was a, this wonderful man that over his life, um, in many ways, he had been victimized. <clears throat> um, he worked for 35 years for a company, an oil company, in fact. When he retired, they had s- just sold the company a year before. He was left with $35 a month in retirement. Oh. Whereas he had well earned over 35 years a much bigger retirement, but he just didn't get it because the new company took over. So he couldn't live on just his Social Security and $35 a month. So what he did was he would buy and sell in the stock market, and that's how he would supplement. Well, when this house burned down, he was having to cash in all this stock that he had where he had been living on dividends and so on. He couldn't do it. He had to buy washer, dryer, car, everything. He had to buy new. But he was supposed to be reimbursed by the insurance company. The secretary, this person, saw him as very vulnerable and one who she could take advantage of and hoped he would die before the truth would ever come out. So anyway, she... um, She just, you know, took all his money. Well, the story is... So you knew this, is you knowing this story? Knowing this story. Okay, so now you're going to... I use this as the basic story. Okay. And then, um, in the storyline for the movie, okay, we have a mixed-blood Native American kid who comes to live with him and who discovers the swindle. And... Together, he and he, this is his uncle, they try to get justice to come out. But it ends up like a big collusion between everybody because nobody wants to help bring this all out to, to get it righted. Well, a lot of people <coughs> lose because they a lot, of, a people lot of fraud lose. involved. Yeah. And the agent himself would have lost because he would have lost his license because he allowed his secretary to handle the whole thing. And he never would hear the old man's side of the story. He just let it go. Figured, you know, because his secretary said, he's been paid. Look, look at these checks. He's, okay, all checks that she had cashed, okay. Anyway, um, so the basic storyline is this kid who comes to live with him and how the truth comes out. He's an American Indian, right? Yes, Native American. Okay. Uh, And I have had, I can't even tell you how many Native Americans have read this story now. It's this kid who takes a stand for justice, and he's caught in between. I mean, he's got to pay a big price himself. But the old man does die. The kid takes a stand. He's not going to let this injustice Don't tell the end. And I won't tell the end. (laughs) I'm not going to tell the ending. But um, 
Anyway, it becomes the riveting part of well, the story. Well, I, I want to go just for a second into um, some wonderful scenes that she has. This uh, boy is kidnapped because he's trying to make a difference, and he's challenged everybody. <coughs> And uh, now some people are very aware that uh, they can be taken down by this young kid. And uh, so he's kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And what happens in a cave where they put him mm -hmm. is um, every uh, American Indian has grown up on stories of the spirit and spirits that protect. And that is an amazing scene. Now, as I recall, we talked about the music from... What show? What movie? Hans Zimmer. Um, but it's Batman Begins. Yeah, the the, <coughs> the drumming, the drumming yeah. sound uh -huh. from Batman uh, begins to you begin to feel. I'm getting tingly all over yeah. here just because I know that music, and it begins while he's in this very spiritual, mm -hmm. well, in this cave that brings on this very spiritual yeah. experience that he has. You can hear the Native American DNA right. start you to come can. up in this kid. That's it. That's uh -huh. well put. Right. Native American. And so he um, it's what happens to him and how he is rescued and how he gets out of this mess that he's gotten himself in, that he's put in, in this kidnapping. But it's more than that. We get to watch this young man go from a belligerent kid that moved in with an uncle that he didn't want to be with. Mm -hmm. It was inconvenient, but his parents threatened him. If he didn't do this, then he was going to lose some other privileges. So he goes to help this uncle. And he's really an ornery teenage, what is he, 19, 20-ish? 20 20-ish, 20 yeah. early 20s. Very, very um, agitated young man about everything that's good. And uh, as we see him... Well, he's we, like many youth today. Well, that's it. Who that's are, why I said he could be anywhere <laughs> yeah, in the world. Yeah. But he wants, his, he wants his freedom, but he wants everything that comes with uh, working a full day. And he doesn't have that. But we watch him change. We watch his life change. Then we watch him take on a cause that then gives him direction. And um, there's a, a lawyer in this. And I can't remember if he's a good guy or a bad guy at this point, the lawyer. It depends which one. <laughs> there's several lawyers. Well, I was going to talk about the Tom <coughs> Selleck part. That we well, had, that's a good lawyer. <laughs> that's a good lawyer, right, as I recall. And so uh, we're looking for Tom Selleck to come and take this part. But and he does. He doesn't know it yet. No. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know it. Okay, is there such a good thing? Oh, okay, we're getting on the screen. Is there such a good thing as is, is a good there lawyer? Such a, thing as a good lawyer. <laughs> Can you say that your dad was an attorney? <laughs> okay, so um, the way this story unfolds, and I don't. I hope you didn't change the courtroom scene. But Don't tell the ending. I'm not going to tell the ending. Okay. <laughs> but the courtroom scene for this movie is worth going to the movie for once it gets into a movie. It's certainly worth reading the book. Is it in the book? Is, is, it is. is. Gonna go? Yeah, it's oh, in yes. the book. Oh, yes. This scene is absolutely, it will leave you tingling all over and you're going, wow, this amazing ending to this story. It's just totally, totally. Now, in the process, I know that you have gone to see Heads of Nations Mm -hmm. Down Indian in four nations. corners, down in sure. Indian nations, and you've yes. met with them, and yes. you've uh, videotaped them because I've seen those, mm -hmm. and they have endorsed this script mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally. Oh, every Native American who has read it has says that has got to be done. It they can want change it to be lives, done. not just <coughs> their mm -hmm. young people, but change lives. Okay, so where are we? That's really why I invited you today. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I really want to know where we are, and we've got a minute and a half. Okay. I can't divulge the name of the group, but I just signed a co-venture agreement with a production company that has just come together. It's going to be very a very dynamic production company. So this is They've getting made. People. This, this movie is, is happening. Yeah, it's going to get made. It's we're going, going to, to see get made. it when? Next we're, year? I think we're going to be producing it next year. Next year? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh. This is exciting. Now, it's I know that you exciting. had interviewed and you've uh, had a lot of young, uh, uh, young men audition for the part of the show. Well, we have man. a couple who really want the part. We have one of uh, a kid who's a part of the Wolf Pack in the Twilight series. He really wants the lead role. We have Rudy Youngblood, who had the lead role in Mel Gibson's Apocalypto. He right. says he wants the lead role in this. Um, <coughs> so those are good beginnings. And then... Um, uh, and we have yet to call Tom Selleck. Okay, yeah. well, hello, now Tom. Now this, kind of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not until we have money in the bank, okay? But we are working now with the um, 
to this new production company. They've got some great people on board. A couple of them have been very big in special effects. One of them did was a lead supervisor on Avatar, and the other one just did 300 for True Grit. They've done Harry Potter. They've done X-Men. They've oh done Lion, goodness. Witch, and the Wardrobe. you got the big guys. You name it. Yeah, you they're the great. Right, and well, they are part of this now, company. It so. was Phantom Justice. It may get changed, although I love that name. It's easy yeah. to remember. Uh, this is Pat Sheranian with her good, good friend, Helene Holt, <laughs> famous author award. Go buy these books. They're great. Look forward to the ones that are yet to come. We didn't even get what else you're working on. That's for another time, <laughs> which we'll do. Have a great, great weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate you. Blessings. <laughs>